Hello everyone. Uh, it's nice to be here this Friday uh, for another Solanese seminar online. Um, before to start with the talk, uh, I'm glad to present to Joseph Jacobs. We, today we have two speakers. Uh, I'm glad to introduce to Joseph Jacobs and Flavio Ramos. Um, and, uh, at this point, I had to I had to excuse because I had to read the presentation of both because it's quite special. And it's special because half, half is in Spanish, uh, half is in English. And, and the presentation of both are interleaved, uh, part in English, part in Spanish. Um, okay, now, um, <clears throat> uh, Flavio Ramos and Joseph Jacobs uh, bring tomatillos and hot peppers for H.M. Klaus, uh, an international company, uh, seed company based on Davis in California. Ubicado en los Mochis, Sinaloa, Flavio está encargado de mejor, del mejoramiento del tomatillo y los chiles. Joseph works from the Davis Research site where he managed the fresh market, the hot market, pepper breeding program targeting in Mexico and North Africa. Uh, después de cumplir su doctorado con la Universidad Autónoma Agraria Antonio Narro en Saltillo, Coahuila, eh, Flavio se juntó con H.M. Klaus para hacer mejoramiento de chiles, principalmente de guajillos y de tomatillos. After finishing a uh, graduate, uh, graduate work uh, uh, in genetics at UC Davis, uh, Joseph joined Asian Klaus as a tomato breeder before moving to the Spicer Cozy, hot pepper. Uh, Flavio and Joseph uh, empezaron a trabajar juntos cuando Flavio entró con Asian Klaus in, in Mexico in 2007. Learning from each other and from the markets, Joseph and Flavio uh, worked closely closely together to bring new value to the pepper and tomatillo growers of the world. Okay, uh, today they are going to present us the tall entitled uh, Mejoramiento del Tomatillo Fisales Filadélfica en el Siglo XXI as Amen Klaus, a breeding program rooted in place focus, focus on bringing value and linking new technology to deep agronomy practice. Um, thank you, Joseph and Flavio, to accept our invitation. Um, please, can, I know, I'm not sure that uh, Joseph is going to start, I, I guess, oh, I'm not sure. Uh, <clears throat> please can share your screen and start with the talk, and it's nice to, 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 to have you, both of you here today. Perfect. Now it's perfect. Thank okay. you. Okay, we're going to start then. Um, so as Flavio and I were, were putting this uh, talk together, first we started with the idea of presenting tomatillos to you because that's a relatively recent hybrid breeding program in the marketplace. But then since we work so much together on hot peppers and tomatillos, we thought we would share you with you some of what we do in the hot peppers as well. Um, so as I speak about the hot peppers, I mean, it'll be a little bit more general and I'm gonna show you more types and where we are placed in the world. And then as we get to Flavio's breeding program, we'll go into a little bit more detail. I think what you're going to see with us, though, is that we're going to speak quite generally compared to what you've been used to for the last uh, nine months. We've enjoyed being having the opportunity to listen to these conversations, so we feel like it's a good chance to give back. All right, let's get started. So who are we at HM Close? Um, and then hot pepper breeding, we'll talk about that. And we're going to talk about the areas in the world where we breed hot peppers. And then we'll go, like I said earlier, into more detail on tomatillo breeding. It's a very regional crop. We've domesticated what's a weedy species, and we're developing brand new idiotypes for growers. And we breed for a diverse customer base in, in Mexico. So HM Close, who are we? Uh, it's a international seed company. We have three hubs. We're in three regions, and we have uh, 16 subsidiaries. The regions that we call them AMPA, EMEA, and Asia. And it's in, each one of those is considered as a business unit, but they all contribute to the overall performance of HM Close. Um, our sales, about 50% come out of AMPA. As breeders, commercial breeders, we're, we're very focused on sales. I mean, we need to make money to keep the seed company going, um, but we also like to work with genetics. So that's why we're here. 43% uh, of our sales comes from EMEA, and we have a small amount that's starting to come from Asia. We expect that to be growing in the next, uh, next decade for sure. And then if we look at the, we're distributed about a third, third across, a third equally across all the regions in terms of the number of employees working. 
And these are the, um, I think if you do the math here, it looks like 27 different species, but it's about 50 breeders that produce the hybrids that we sell in the market. And with the exception of beans, we are a hybrid breeding company. And HM Close is a member of the Lima Grain Group. We're an international agricultural cooperative that's based originally in France, but is now obviously everywhere in the world. Uh, our main goal is to provide sustainable solutions for agriculture by advancing successful products that fit the customer's needs and help reduce the impact to the growing environment. So you can think about disease resistance as an obvious example of where that would work. We breed, produce, and market our vegetables throughout the world. We are very interested in our customer success so that we can be also you know, successful. And then I got, as we were putting this together, this is, was got me thinking about the contrast between the, what's on your left, you see the pipeline or a funnel where we start with, um, if we think about breeding starts and managing genetic diversity, we start with quite a bit of diversity. And then by the time we get to the bottom of the funnel, we have very few things that come out of it. Now, all of our technology is leveraged to make what come, is to reduce what goes in and maximize the quality of what comes out. That's something we're still learning. But then if you flip that funnel on its head, what this is in terms of the workflow at what HM Close is, the breeders, we're not very many, we're 50, remember? Ish, 50 breeders, and we have 3,000 employees. So 3,000 employees that are delivering those seeds into the commercial mar markets from management all the way to seed production to shipping and packing. It's, it's a quite a complex operation. But it's something that uh, we like to do and we think we're good at it. So we're going to talk about peppers today from my part. And this is a, gives you an example of the kind of peppers that we manage. And on the left, the charts you see, this, this chart, um, let me see if I can get the laser. Okay, this chart shows, is kind of a map of the genetic diversity within the program. Not surprisingly, you can see over here that the sweet peppers probably are more, well, not probably, are more structured. And the hot peppers show quite a bit of diversity. And as I show you more about the, our hot pepper breeding, that might give you some insight as to why that is. The other thing you can see when you look at the kind of quality differences that we have to deal with in the market space, it's, it's pretty interesting. Um, if you're managing upstream research, it can be a little bit complicated, as you might imagine, because each one of those are traits that we have to breed for. Uh, so just a, maybe a reminder, where did, how did peppers get dispersed throughout the world? So Christopher Columbus was looking for black pepper. He brought the new spice from Haiti, and then he brought that back to Europe. And then from Europe, it was disseminated through the Ottoman Empire and then throughout the rest of the world. And what's pretty cool now is that we get to go to those parts of the world and see, and we're gonna show you how we breed for those markets. Um, Capsicum anum is the most widely cultivated hot pepper species. Chinensian frutessens are also cultivated. Uh, there are five hot pepper species that are cultivated. Annum is definitely the biggest. The main hot types that we breed from Mexico are the jalapeno, serrano, ancho, or sometimes called poblano. Um, so in terms of where we work, this is the, we have, of those 30 capsicum species, five have been domesticated. Um, we have three with significant economic importance, the annual protestants and chinenses, and that's that group inside of the box. But we definitely work within this, we access, well, we try to access genetics from all of these pools where we are, of course, blocked is um, over here in the pubescence area, the purple flowered species, there is a significant barrier to crossing. So we don't really work there too much. And then if we look at the actual production, now we start to go in the production world. Um, China is definitely the biggest producer. And then it, it's basically Asia. We start with China, India, Indonesia. And with those, you already have 75% of the planted acreage of hot peppers. But then in Mexico, which is where my program is focused, um, we only have 5% of the world. Mexico and the U.S. is where I breed for. Flavio uh, breeds for Mexico and the U.S. processing. And these are the, this is a nice picture showing you some cultivated wild types and the different, oh, sorry about that. Um, 
shapes and heat levels, wall thickness, different colors, different capsaicin levels. Oh, they're, they're not showing, sorry about that. I guess the numbers are too big. Um, but the, I have another chart that will show that a little bit better. So hot peppers, what makes them hot? It's the, the presence of the capsaicin. These are natural substances that are produced. They, burn a, they produce a burning sensation in your mouth, but they also are known to induce uh, euphoria in some people. Um, the people that like hot peppers the most can get the most euphoric feeling after eating them. They have no flavor order, odor. Uh, you, for our purposes, capsaicin is an important flavor attribute. We do not breed for high capsaicin levels. In the processing markets, we try to hit a certain uh, bandwidth in terms of the actual hot, the hot level. And then this, uh, this is the chart that actually, you can see the numbers in terms of the actual capsaicin levels. So pepper spray is up there at very, you know, 2 million. The hottest pepper that we know of is actually coming from where it's, it's a machine harvested, it's produced pepper that's a bird chili type, and it's on the order of 2 million. It's actually probably hotter than the Carolina Reaper that you see here. That is an annuum, but the, 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 the color here I'm trying to show is that these are the Chinensi groups, and then we get into uh, frutescens or the land race annuums like uh, brasculum. It's hard for me to say that. Here's another uh, uh, frutescens. And then we get down here into this rocoto. I'm pretty sure that's not the right level. It should be a factor of 10 higher. It's on the order more of 2,500. Just let the cat in. Uh, where, but here is where um, all of our breeding efforts are falling. And so in the hot pepper market, for me, I look at Serrano's and I should be around five to 10,000 Scoville. 10,000 is pretty hot for most people to eat. 5,000 is very hot for like a jalapeno. So the jalapeno range is three to five. Even though the numbers are quite different, for some people, five is a very different flavor. Uh, of a jalapeno, a five can be harder to eat than the 10. And then bell peppers, nothing, hopefully. Um, Anaheim's are down to 1,000 maybe 2,500 for North Africa types, and then finally the Ancho types, also around 1,000. Okay, so hot pepper is an extremely diverse crop. It's produced throughout the world. There are many kinds of sauces. There, it's been used, uh, it has a use in medicine. We know that the capsaicin molecule can be used to block the pain receptors that each of our cells have. There have been some benefits shown with reducing, um, maybe having an anti-carcinogenic effect, but I'm not sure of any products that actually are used in that way. It's definitely, a, it can be a digestive aid. You can also just, it can disturb your digestion as well because of the heat. Um, there's quite a bit there. It's great, well, the vitamins, we like those and we do see patents, for example, for varieties with vitamin A, C, and E high levels. Okay, so there's around 1.2 million cultivated hectares outside of China, and 50% of China is OP. Uh, a lot, half of the acreage that's field produced is for processing, for flakes, for dry use. And then if we start to, we're going to, I think I'll just go forward and move into where we are in the world with our hot pepper breeding. So Southeast Asia and India. So this map shows the sites that we have breeders for HM Close in the world. So I'm based in Davis, Flavio's based in Mexico. We have two breeders in India, uh, Ramesh and Sunil, and we have one breeder in Thailand whose name is Noom. Uh, Noom actually works for Thailand and Indonesia. We also have, so we have breeding stations and then we have um, what we call uh, trial stations that we use. And so you can see basically that the hot pepper program, certainly mine has a global footprint. The Indian program is more regional and the Thai program is both Indo India and Indonesia. So we're gonna go very quickly to the different areas. This is our station in Bangalore and that's the station on the left and the previous breeder who just left, his name is Vishwanath. And that's, he's standing in front of one, is, uh, one of his varieties that's with a grower for, and the grower field dries before taking it to the market. 
And so here on this map of India, you can see the bottom star is where our station is. And the, the one of the prime, it's close to one of the big production areas for what's called dry pepper. And that's the, the dry pepper market, that's Gunther market is where, that's the main target for uh, Vishwanath and Ramesh's breeding programs. So again, this is the grower. Uh, he's separating the, or his crew is separating the product based on quality attributes that they're um, looking for color differences. And it's remarkable to visit the field after they've gone through it because you can see a substantial difference in the different groups. And then this is the actual market itself. Just trying to give you some scope. Um, to this, this area where they have all these dried peppers, they dry them in the sun, some of them in the growers, and then they get bagged and the buyers come and they, they will take a punch, um, a sample out of each bag and they'll look at it and they'll immediately assess and make a decision on how much they want to buy. But in terms of the surface area that's for this dry, it's on the order of 100 acres. It's a huge space. And some people actually wear masks pre-COVID because it's so hot as you walk through. It's pretty cool. So these are the dry types that we uh, breed for India. And where we really, the main focus is in this group, which is the, um, this is the hot pep, this is what's called high capsaicin and relatively and, and good color. And then there is also um, high, uh, medium capsaicin, but high color. And those are the main markets that we're breeding for in India. And now we move north, and this is our station in Panipat, and that's the breeder uh, Sunil in the field, and there's an example of seed extraction. So it's a very simple station, but it's also an extremely challenging environment to grow peppers in, uh, because it's in the north of India, near Delhi, and this, this area is characterized by very hot summers and very cold winters. So you can actually test both sets of genetics in your material if that's of interest. Also excellent for uh, naturally transmitted white uh, virus diseases. And then his program is, uh, Sunil's is, is focused on what we call the fresh Indian types. And so you have, um, it's really this group, these two groups here. Some of these can actually come, these Asian dual fresh can come from our breeding program in Indonesia and Thailand. And some of it comes from his material. This is where most of uh, Sunil's work is. So I guess the point of showing you these different types is there's quite a bit of diversity in terms of the market trait that you can look at pungency values or different. Uh, the, maybe there's a caveat that we, I need to share is that the Indian or the Asian Scoville units are, are reported on dry, not fresh. And so you can divide or multiply by, divide by a factor of five, something like that, or 10, depending on the type. And then we go to Thailand, and Thailand, uh, that's where our breeding program is based, and that's one of the best places to have very spicy food. Both countries are excellent for that, and our breeder, Noom, is based in Konken, so you see Noom there in front of one of his bird chili types, and then on the right, their star shows where our station is, and we also use that in the hot pepper program. And his breeding program is basically based on uh, two two main types this um, this type right here which we call a bird chili and it's called a bird chili because the fruit presents and they're they're pointing towards the sky and then these what are called red fresh types very thick wool and uh, his main issues are um, tropical disease resistance and then the hot pepper my breeding program so like to like tomatillos my breeding program is a highly regional crop it's mainly focused in mexico but i it also we also sell seeds here in the us and we also sell seeds into um, europe primarily north africa the hot peppers are more diverse than the sweet peppers that we have that hm close breeds the breeding is very well supported so on this table or i'm sorry this graph of the world you can see where we have support functions or breeding functions throughout the world. So we have field biologists, field development specialists, those are research trial specialists that help with the evaluation and the identification of the most, the best material at the commercial level. We have cell biologists who help us with say dihaploid production. We have geneticists that help identify the genetic architecture of new traits that we're trying to breed and also to give us markers to speed those trait interrogations. We also have discovery and application pathologists. 
same goals. Application is going to help us do our routine where we don't have markers. And then the discovery pathologists are going to help us identify those new marker trait combinations and basically unlock new traits that will help us in the market space. Our analytics and um, database organization support comes out of France. We have a, it's, you might describe it as a growing pain, but it's a, it's a operating system that all breeders use now and it connects us to our lab to our pathology to so it's trying to streamline our process it just makes it harder to make a crossing block if you want to understand the world we see it understand the world the way a breeder sees it so it's a we have global reach but we have very local focus with the hot pepper breeding and so the program, we, this is just to show you quickly, we work out of Mexico, out of Florida, and this is here up in, in California. And then these are my main types. And jalapeno is the biggest market in the world for me, and that's where we focus quite a bit of effort. And then we have ancho types, which will turn chocolate or red. Uh, the guajillo type, we no longer breed. Um, we do have germplasm, but that's a, it's a, it's a large market, but it's smaller margin. Serranos, that's a very important market for us as well. Chilaca is like the Guajillo. It's a special, specialty dry market, but we, it's a secondary focus. So my main focus is this triangle right here in terms of Mexico. And then the Mexican production system is, you know, it's, it's extremely adaptive. So they use the fruits in the fresh, they use the fruits in the dry, they use, and the dry qualities are also a component of when, how we breed. We need to have the, the dry yields or the dry attributes in mind as we breed. Of course, a lot of it's processed as well. And then the other type that I'm working on are these Mediterranean types. And so you can see what looks like a hot banana. You can see the cayenne, which the, this one here, it's called a large cayenne, is more of a New Mexican type, I would say. That's actually a mislabel, sorry about that. I think these two tend to overlap with each other in the market space. The Sibri is, is really without heat. This is for Turkey and then Cayenne type is for, if we think about countries like Jordan, Egypt, somewhat. So I think that's, that's what we do in the hot peppers. And now I'm gonna let Clavio take over in the tomatillo breeding. Sorry, is the tomatillo is the principal area in Mexico is regional crops essential to Mexico is the, is the, now is the, the presentation. The tomatillo is the principal area in, in, in produc producción in Mexico. Is the Fisalis isocarpa and same Fisalis philadelphica. Is the origin, is the two, two fossil is the new discovery species in, in La Patagonia. Is the years old in the discovery in 20, 2017. Is the Fisales in, in the world is the 19 species. Is the, the principal cultivate is in Philadelphia. Fisales Philadelphica and Fisales Reticulata and Fisales Peruviano in, in America Cent, in America Southwest is the Fisales Peruviano. Is next. El origen de historia is the, is del, viene desde la palabra Nahual, the word Ayuca Tomal is the, the world etiología is the tomatillos, is the, desde la época de los mayas, is originario de, de América, y, y el principal centro de, es en México. Los tomatillos se cultivan desde época de los, de los aztecas, y es de se cultivaban entre las parcelas o la, o la milpa de maíz y fueron cultivados en, desde hace muchos años. Los tomatillos tienen un número cromosómico de 24 
pertenece a la familia de las solanáceas. Es una especie que se considera autoincompatible. Siguiente. En, en México es de, de principal área for distribution de diferentes especies en México. Es de 70 especies here. Y the principal area is in the center of Mexico, the distribution, and southwest of Mexico and north of Mexico. This the center of Mexico is the now is the principal area for the crop and tomatillos, and now is the increasing this area for crops in Chiapas, Puebla, Veracruz. The other principal area for producer tomatillos in in North Mexico in Chihuahua, and Sonora and Sinaloa is the principal producer in Mexico. In Mexico now is the twenty thousand hectares is the the more producer is in open field is now is the a little producer in net houses in is aggregated the value and tomatillos quality. Is the principal area they produce in next house is Sinaloa, is the center of Mexico in Querétaro. The tomatillos is the producer next. Is the producer in, in the zero C to front the level C and to or 19 feet, for example, in Zacatecas, is the, the principal pressure for tomatillos producer in Mexico is the high temperatures and low humidity. Is the principal the pressure for from pests and disease. This the the collect the samples from Mexico in 2016 is the in the, the principal areas is the the pressure for is the the virus TMB TSWB and fungus fungus and Cisoctonia este Fusarium and Alternaria. And the other principal problem is the next, Joseph, is the, is the power mildew pressure. The tomatillo is used in, in the cuisine in Mexico, is the, the tomatillo used in the, desde los Aztecas. Y el principal, the principal use is the for salsas, is the for hands salsas, is the combination con garlic, pepper, serranos, and jalapeños, and onions. Is the very easy for the the make and the very good nutrition. Now is the the industry is the for the commercial salsas is the increasing the productivity and quality standard and reducing the manufacture times and is possi possible to reduce the cost. Is the now in the in industry in Mexico is the principal is the herdes and la costeña is the producer more salsas for to export to use and other part of the world. The tomatillo flavor is the, the principal macronutrients, is the protein, fats, carbohydrate, water, and protein. Is the, the, the comparison the tomatillo than tomatoes is the is the tomatillo is more better 
than tomatoes in the protein, the, the nibble, the protein, the fast, the carbohydrate, the water is the more similar and other nutrients. The, the vitamin content in tomatillo and tomatoes is the is very good in tomatillos, is the when same to toma, tomato. The problem the tomatillo breeding in in Mexico is in in Los Mochis is in, in Sinaloa State is the the principal city is now is the develop and line and develop new new hybrids. The tomatillo program is the the principal world is the the producer the the green tomatillos is the the purple color is a little bit hectares and yellow color is the more bit. Is the principal program is the in green in green color. Is the principal characteristic for for the development is the in breeding is yield adaptability, vigor the plant, healthy plant in disease resistance. And the fruit is the firmness, dark green fruit, size, no cracking, the husking, shape life, and flavor in novelty. This uh, produce the tomatillo, the flower, the plant, the fruit, and different states for the development of the fruit and, and the plant. The tomatillo breeding is the the tomatillo is the self incompatible is the tomatillo is the wild is very difficult for the auto fecundation is now is the this discovery for tomatillo for self and the same for to crop crop the mice is the promote is the crossing in the natural heterosis. In three years ago is the is in, in is the for for check the the new line in development of HM close is the this feature is it open the steel and grow the the pollen is introducing and to ovulo ovary is a very interesting the the new line is very good for self this evaluation the 200 lines in net houses in, in 2015 is the to check the this this picture is the no seed and open open pollination is the the new line is you looking the seed and fruit is the more the the forty percent the the line. Is the the statistical that is here is no the the plant gran esmeralda is the pollination open pollination variety is now is the more more better the line for develop when seed in fruit. And in HM Close is the develop different lines for male or female is the hand cross use and 
and fall and net houses. Use is the this is the the new line is the the fruit is the for the the crosses is the you look the seed and fruit. The fruit is quality. The producer is the is the is is good. Um, pero es un desafío tener más semillas en 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 los en los frutos todavía. Is the cross and block and the producer hybrids and 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 mochis and other sites sitio is in in Peru. The principal problem in 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 tomatillos is in the moment in the the cross is the temperature. Is the las temperaturas altas y la humedad relativa baja es es mucho problema para la producción o las cruzas en tomatillos. Hicimos un ensayo probando hacer cruzas en en primavera y otras en invierno. Y aquí podemos observar cómo las las temperaturas aquí se elevaban casi a 43 grados y la humedad relativa era muy baja, la línea hielo Y entonces aquí teníamos muy, en el momento de la polinización teníamos mucho problema en en la polinización. Pero en la época de invierno las temperaturas son oscilan entre 25 o 30 grados y la humedad relativa es mayor, arriba de 60 grados, de 60%, perdón. Y las polinizaciones son mejores en en estas bajo estas condiciones de temperatura. Siguiente. Y aquí podemos observar una lo que les comentaba cuando hacemos cruzas en en fall o en winter es 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 mucho mejor tenemos may, mejor desarrollo de fruto este mayor cantidad de semilla por fruto y cuando hacemos las cruzas en spring es más difícil este por las altas temperaturas que les comento es mucho mejor hacer en, en, en invierno y, y fall. Para la cosecha de los frutos, tenemos una estándar que los frutos de change de color, es de more yellow color, es de la semilla debe ser color marrón para que esté madura. Y, y es cuando el momento cuando nosotros cosechamos. Después de las del inicio de la cruza pasan como 40 50 días para que el fruto esté maduro este para poder cosechar la semilla estos son ensayos que hemos venido realizando con las variedades con las nuevas variedades tenemos tamaño fue un híbrido que lanzamos en el mercado en el 2010 y estábamos comparando con gran esmeralda que era la variedad de polinización abierta y tenemos otro híbrido que se llama Siqueiros que lanzamos en el 2015 para el mercado de México este y como podemos ver vamos observando que hemos ido incrementando el rendimiento y la calidad de fruta a través del tiempo que hemos ido mejorando esta especie tenemos ahora una patente que hicimos hace dos años este para una nueva variedad que se llama Clemente. Esta es, es una variedad que estamos lanzando para cosecha mecánica. Ya que es muy fácil de, de quitar la cáscara. Este tenemos el registro en México también el PBR, PBA. Y aquí podemos observarlas en un análisis estadístico que hicimos de de las diferentes variedades de las que se le quitan la cáscara y las que es muy difícil quitar la cáscara y podemos observar cómo aquí Clemente es, es es muy fácil de quitar la cáscara comparado con con otros híbridos o con otras variedades tenemos el la 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 presentación de Clemente este que estamos lanzando ahora para México en este mes 
es un tomate de tamaño mediano, un color verde medio. Es muy precoz, este, 50, 45, 50 días para la primera cosecha después del trasplante. Y tenemos también su fácil, su fácil cosecha a mano, ya sea a mano o también puedes usar una máquina. Vamos a ver ahí un pequeño video al final para, para que ustedes lo, lo, lo observen. Y esos son los, los, los paquetes que usamos nosotros con Filtrop y, y las presentaciones que, que estamos manejando para, para el mercado de, de México. El gobierno en México ha tenido interés en el mejoramiento de tomatillos y tenemos, nosotros hicimos, trabajamos con ellos en los proyectos PEI en el 2015-2016 para, para avanzar algunos híbridos que, que, estábamos, que, estábamos, que estábamos mejorando. Y en, y en el 2000, esta es una ficha técnica de Clemente, este, trabajamos con instituciones, con universidades en los proyectos, este, trabajamos con una universidad de aquí de, de Sinaloa y con otra universidad de Antonio Narro de, de Coahuila para, para trabajar en conjunto, que era la parte de lo que, estaba, lo que pedía el, el gobierno de México. Y, y una de las características que estábamos, que estábamos buscando es encontrar la calidad de la fruta, poder encontrar la calidad de la fruta que la industria está está ahora demandando y una de las hicimos diferentes ensayos en, en campo abierto usando estacado guiando la planta hacia arriba este un crecimiento normal de los tomatillos es en piso también usamos la producción en, en net houses y macro -tunes. los principales componentes de los tomatillos pues como era el ácido cítrico, el ácido cítrico es muy importante en la industria, que los tomatillos tengan un nivel considerable, ya que cuando haces la salsa, este, el contenido de ácido cítrico te mantiene la salsa unida con el agua. Si los niveles de ácido cítrico son muy bajos, la salsa se separa y, y tú ves en la, en la presentación, vas a ver en la botella el agua abajo y la salsa arriba, los sólidos arriba. Entonces, con, los, con, los, con estos nutrientes puedes tú, con lo ácido, puedes tú que la salsa se mantenga unida. Entonces, desarrollando, estamos trabajando también en, en tener variedades que, que puedan satisfacer esas necesidades de la, de la industria. Este, en los niveles de azúcar es, es, y, y en los niveles de antioxidantes. Aquí, cuando hicimos el, el, este trabajo con... Con el Conacit podemos ver que cuando usas el macro túnel o, o producción en estacado, siempre la calidad de los tomatillos es mucho mejor que cuando, cuando los produces en el, en el piso. Los tomatillos, este, tenemos el trabajo aquí en México, tenemos el soporte, es global. En, de la compañía, pero trabajamos en áreas muy localizadas para la producción en México y buscando satisfacer las la demandas de los productores. Este, buscamos también la calidad de la semilla y el, y el rendimiento o, la, o el aumento en la calidad, del, en la calidad química, físico-química de los tomatillos. Y estamos trabajando en adaptar o encontrar nuevos materiales, nuevos híbridos, que sean que tengan mejor tamaño, que tengan mejor calidad, que tengan mejor tolerancia a enfermedades. Y hemos, y hemos avanzado mucho en estos, en estos últimos años. Ahorita voy a poner yo sé de un video donde podemos, podemos ver lo que, lo que les estaba comentando de los de los materiales, del nuevo material Clemente que estamos lanzando.
Okay, bear with me a minute. I'm going to try to see if see if this works. We can see the video. Okay. I don't know if I did the screen, the sound. Let's do it. Yep, no. and the sound works. Perfect. Hi, I'm Ricardo Castro, product development coordinator for the domestic market in Mexico. We're here to talk about the program on tomatillos. This strategy is based on uh, look for something that you can harvest with machine, different than, you know, right now it's doing in Mexico, which a lot of people cost a lot of money. HM Close has the best varieties you need in tomatillos. Our program is designed to deliver more competitive material. It's only 11 years old, but we are definitely the market leader in tomatillos. And we bring uh, new disease resistances, new methods of growing, producing, harvesting the tomatillo that it all are focused on adding to your bottom line. I'm happy to take this time to, to introduce you a new product, Clemente. This is a tomatillo with great innovations that we presented to the marketplace. One of the innovative part of this product is the, these husking capabilities. Even that you can mechanize the product as well, the ability to maximize clean fruit after the harvest bring an excellent value to the product. This morning we ran the harvester through the Davis Tomatillo trial. Um, the Clemente was excellent coming out of the machine, dehusking through the, through the harvester. Uh, from a commercial standpoint, this gives a processor a, a lot of flexibility. It saves a lot of money. Aquí estamos hoy presentando nuestro nuevo material, Clemente F1. Este es un material que tiene características muy interesantes como son la fácil cosecha. Los beneficios de, de la nueva variedad Clemente, este, sus nuevas características son su alto rendimiento, su precocidad, su buena calidad de fruto, la firmeza, color y su fácil pelado. Aquí podemos ver, para quitar la cáscara es muy fácil de eliminar, mientras que otra, otras variedades que hay en el mercado Es difícil de separar la cáscara. In the tomatillo market, as usual, you can harvest a crop 70 days later. Clemente, you can go to the field 49 days later. That is quite interesting for any grower related to this crop. When you combine these traits, you create an innovative value, not for the organization, also a value for the grower or for the corporation related to this type of products, because you can minimize the cost, you can create a crop very agile. You can get in and out as soon as possible. And with high yield, earliness, quality, the husking capabilities and value, there is a perfect recipe for success. Next time you see me, we're gonna see each other in the field. I want to experience something that nobody has in the marketplace. And with the HM Club organization, we open a new window of opportunities for each other. See you soon. Esa es nuestra nueva variedad Clemente que estamos promoviendo en este momento. Gracias. Oh, look at that. Snow. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you to Joseph and Flavio for this interesting talk. Um, and sorry to everyone for the small set pads. Uh, these things happen sometimes. <laughs> but now we have some time for questions. Uh, if someone uh, want to ask something, just uh, turn on your microphone. Stacy, please. Um, yeah, I have a question about the last thing we saw. Um, donde dice que pela más, más fácil. Um, es decir, que es menos pegajoso. So like the, the shell comes off so easy. And these things are often very sticky and the husk is sticky and the skin is sticky. So is Clemente less sticky? Mm, no, es más pegajoso. O sea, como que la cáscara es más pegajosa y el fruto es más pegajoso. Pero como es entonces que se pela más fácil? Mm, porque la parte del, donde está conectado el pedúnculo con la cáscara es muy fácil de cortar. Yes. 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 Yes.
um, tal vez lo perdí, pero en la parte donde mencionó que ahora se puede polinizar, um, no sé cómo decir, uh, puede polinizar um, autónoma. Um, eso era algo que encontraron naturalmente en el campo, una variedad natural, o eso fue, o cómo, cómo encontraste esta, esta habilidad. Hicimos muchas, muchas pruebas, este, este, de las colectas, todas las colectas que tuvimos de, de tomatillos en México, fuimos seleccionando únicamente las plantas que se autofecundaban. Este, los teníamos en lotes aislados, este, controlados, y fuimos seleccionando únicamente las que se autofecundaban de todo lo que teníamos, y alcanzamos a quebrar esa autoincompatibilidad y poder desarrollar líneas que, que se autofecundan. Thank you, Stacy. Uh, I have a question. Uh, when you discovered so many lines that were self-compatible, was that surprising? Uh, because it is naturally self incompatible but you found uh how many different lines that were self compatible yeah uh, i can i can step in um so maybe it's good to share at this point. So if you remember the yield trial photograph that Flavio showed where there was a variety on the left called, um, which, which I, I can't say it, but the one on the left was that it's coming from a bulk breeding approach, which manages self incompatibility that way. Gran, Gran Esmeralda is also a variety that um, is, we, we produce it in bulk. And so that way we avoid the incompatibility issues. Um, but we, we are, at a point now where we are getting close to being able to understand the diversity. So far it's structured by families, but you can find it, we can tell you that. Um, when we shared this with uh, the Mexican national breeders, they told us it wasn't possible, <laughs> but it is. But you just found some naturally self-compatible lines? Yeah, they're there. Okay. Enough. Yeah. We don't have the way yet to see the mutations or track them. That's definitely a goal that we want to be able to do. Great. I'm very yeah. interested in that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Rocio. Rocio? Yeah. Thank you. And muchas gracias. Fue una charla increíble. It's a great talk. So, yes, I tengo una pregunta sobre. Mencionabas que en el cultivo del tomatillo. Eh, en sí, durante el verano no es tan buena la producción y es mejor, digamos, la producción de invierno o de otoño. Eh, ¿Han probado hacer algún mejoramiento con hibridización con alguna de las especies? Porque hay, como hay tanta diversidad en las especies silvestres, ¿con alguna de las especies que esté mejor adaptada, digamos, en la fructificación durante, durante el verano? Algunas de las que crecen más en desiertos o, digamos, en zonas más áridas. ¿O creen que esto podría ser posible? Hemos, hemos intentado hacer cruzas entre diferentes especies. En algunas hemos tenido éxito, pero estamos empezando a trabajar en eso. Qué bueno. Genial. Muchas gracias. Oh, so, I mean, it seems like in pepper, we have a little bit more luck. Like if we cross with bacotum, we can get, you know, some hybrids and some seeds that we still have to manage the um, chromosomal instability. But with the tomatillo, everything was rejected. Um, but we're at a point now where we want to go back and try that again, because it, it was one year, one experiment, and we know a lot more about how to take care of the crop. So we know the best conditions to try. We could yeah. also look at the tomato work and maybe look at, you know, styler applications to try to, you know, increase the... the yeah, the, I, would I would suggest trying the self-compatibles as females in those oh, crosses. Yeah, good. Yeah. Thank you. 
Yeah, that's that's super interesting. I need to know because um yes, I was wondering how how common is hybridization in pistolets. Um, so that makes some yes some inferences that if 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 hybridization is actually common or not in the wheel in the wild, um, comparing well if you have tried that and most of the crosses are not successful, so that means probably it's not so common with the species mm -hmm. that we have currently. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we had a comment from, I, from Iris Peralta here in the chat. That she said that uh, this presentation was very interesting. Uh, uh, yeah, and uh, thank you, Joseph and Flavio, for that for the presentation. Uh, uh, I had another. I had a question too. Uh, so solamente quería preguntarle a Flavio si eh, hay algunas otras especies de pisalis que sean comestibles en mercados locales relacionado un poco con la pregunta de Rocío. Hay algunas otras especies que se usen para hacer salsas o además de pisales y tzocarpa? Este, en, el, en la región centro de México hay una pisales reticulata es lo que más se está usando también, que es tomatillo milpero que le llamamos en México, que son tomates muy muy pequeños, pero es pisales reticulata. And can, you, can we cross it? Have you tried, have we tried crossing that? With the uh, Pisales uh, Philadelphia? Flavio, que si, no se escuchaste, escuchaste la pregunta de José, Flavio, que si se puede cruzar reticulata con Itzocarpa. Sí, sí. Hemos intentado, <coughs> perdón, hemos intentado, pero sí es bastante, bastante complicado. No hemos hecho mucho trabajo en, en cruzar muchas especies, pero hemos iniciado. En algunas, les comentaba, tenemos éxito, pero en otras no. Okay, uh, okay we have a few minutes more for uh, Federico had a question, Federico Roda. Uh, Federico, you want to turn on your microphone or you? Buenas eh, días. Eh. Muy interesante la charla. Yo tengo una pregunta acerca de esa sustancia pegajosa encima de los, de los frutos. Eh, en términos de calidades agronómicas, ¿tiene algún interés? Mm. ¿O es más bien algo que tratan de que se reduzca o permite... Siempre la, esa, parte, esa parte de los tomatillos, en, en la naturaleza ellos lo usan como una como una protección contra, contra daños de plagas, de este, insectos. Este. Entonces, es natural que, que debería de tener esa, esa parte pegajosa a los tomatillos, porque es una, es una, una fuente de, de protección para, para el mismo cultivo. O sea que cuando ustedes tienen variedades que tienen menos de eso, en general son variedades más susceptibles a que el, el fruto se pudra. O le, o le... Sí, a que se pudra, a que sea más dañado por el sol, etc. Muchas gracias. De nada. Okay. Uh, I, I had a question for Joseph. Uh, I saw that you you are you are producing chili peppers in different parts of the world. Are you thinking to expand your production to, for example, to South America or to other, I don't know, Australia, Australia, or, I don't know, whatever. Uh, so we. Seed productions are done, yes, in different parts of the world, but the cultivation, uh, we follow the markets. Uh, we do have a few examples where we're trying to introduce something into a market that normally doesn't have that type, but that's a little bit, um, their, people's attitudes towards hot pepper tend to be very specific, and either they like them or they hate them. Um, is what we run into. So, for example, in Australia, we produce a very little bit of a hot pepper, but it's really not for the, it's for the immigrant population that lives inside of Australia. That's, the, those are the main consumers, not the Australia, not the, uh, the English Australians. I don't know how to say it, but um, we, yeah, we have the same idea in Tomatillo though. That's, an, that's probably more possible. I, I was looking for tomatillo here in Colombia, but it's almost impossible to find. So. Oh, we'll send you some seeds. <laughs> you have a garden? We'll get you some seeds. Thank you. Uh, Iris Peralta was around. She, Iris, 
you still have uh, some comment? Or? Well, thank you, Joseph and Flavio. Great talk. I, I wonder if you find in, in your journal class uh, colorful uh, tomatillos, like oranges, uh, because uh, um, Fisalis peruviana, who is cultivated in Peru, has uh, orange fruits, uh, I guess with carotenoids. So I wonder in, in, in your collection, you have also colorful tomatillos. I don't know I can, if you... I can, I can answer. Uh, no, see, uh, Flavio maybe didn't hear. Uh, but mm -hmm. the, when you saw the, the breeding goals were mainly focused on the green market. Uh, we do have purples. We do have some of those uh, yellows. But um, we have not seen orange, like segregating inside of the cultivated or, or, or cultivated breeding program. I can say it that way. Yeah, because uh, pr most probably the, the orange uh, tomatillos could have a lot of uh, uh, beta carotines. That's a so, good idea. recursos of vitamin A. So, mm -hmm. it could be also an important trade for uh, processing or, or green, uh, I mean, fresh vegetables. Mm -hmm. uh, if people consume a lot, uh, I guess, it, I mean, there are some requirements of uh, vitamin A in some of the uh, vegetables. It could be a great way to to introduce those traits regarding a, a, a food source for people. I mean, the deficiency of micronutrients, mm -hmm. for, ex for example. Because that happened when when some uh, vegetables or horticultural crops are so popular, like fisalis in Mexico. Mm -hmm. So it could be a great way to to reach a lot of population and introduce a consumption of vitamins, <laughs> a natural right. consumption. That, that I that's a, that that was my my question, my main okay. question. Es una nueva meta. Gracias. Gracias. Sí. <laughs> and, and I think that is common also, I, it could be, I don't know, but most probably the metabolic pathway could be similar than the one uh, was studied in tomatoes mm -hmm. and peppers. So, mm -hmm. it, and also in, we also call tomatillo or tomate de árbol um, solanum betasium. And there are some colleagues in Argentina who are studying uh, natural populations in Salta, Jujuy, and Tucumán. And they have also found uh, lots of colors and variation, like yellow, orange, purple. So that's the reason we are very interested in colorful fruits. <laughs> mm -hmm. Can you say the species again? Solanum? Betasium. Potassium. Potassium. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It's because it's really, uh, similar to, to beet. Yes. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you, Joseph and Flavio. Thank you. You. Thank, and good, thank, good thank luck you, with your. Yes. And also, uh, there are some native fisalis in, in Argentina and South America that could be also related to, to some of the crops that could be interesting to investigate as mm -hmm. well. For example, here we have Fisalis mendocino mm -hmm. from Mendoza. Yeah, it's a synonym <laughs> of Fisalis viscosa. It's Fisalis a small Fisalis, very resistant to draw. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but um, yeah. That's true, see. Rocio, you know more than that. <laughs> No, 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 it's just, a, yeah, it's a mostly Pisaris viscosa is more a complex, um, so uh, oh, yeah. more to study about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, but we like to mention, I mean, we are very traditional here, so we like uh, Fisalis mendocino. <laughs> 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 the name. <laughs>
Okay. Thank you, Iris. Thank uh, you, we, we, we have time for a, for, a, for, a, uh, for another question. Here is Peter is asking, yeah, you want to ask something? Yeah, yeah, hi. Go ahead. Um, thanks, hi. thanks, Flavio and, and Joseph. That was a really interesting talk. Um, my background isn't in, in uh, tomatillos or peppers, really, but I was wondering for the Clemente cultivar, if you had picked apart or looked at the, the genetic basis for that trait that makes the dehusking easier. Flavio, you want to answer? <laughs> it's, uh, we actually, we, we don't know the genetic architecture yet. It's definitely also another goal for us. Um, yeah. So we can't answer it, but we would like to be able to. Cool. Yeah. yeah well, I'll I'll stay tuned. Yeah. Thanks. And uh, here is um, a comment. Uh, it's not it's not a need name for for this person here, but it's just commenting something about uh, several wild pisalis species develop orange color fruits and are generally, generally sweet. That is the case with uh, Pisalis peruviana, that is quite mm -hmm. common in South America, like a uh, fresh fruit. But in this case, this, 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 this Pisalis itzocarpa is just ripe in, in greens, no, or in yellow. It's not an orange version of, of, of this Pisalis itzocarpa, for example. Mm, like no. Uh, orange, no? It's always no. Uh, green it's or green, yellow. green, yellow, and purple. And it's, all, it's, always, it's always for this salsa, or is possible to eat this like a fresh fruit? I, I, I don't know. It's now it's the, for, it's the more used for salsa, but it's the, the new hybrid is the more possible for the, the ensalada. It's possible. Okay. Because what you wanted to remember about tomatillos, the ones that are for salsa, the, it, at the green stage, your acid levels are high and the sugars are low. So finding one that has good eating quality in the green stage, you have to diminish the acid a bit or bring the sugars up to make you know palatable for most people. Okay. Uh, the, 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 Sorry. <laughs> no, that the question from about the orange color in Pisalis was from Ophelia. <laughs> Sorry, I, I can't see your name there. And uh, she's commenting about uh, she she's uh, saying that. Pisalis cineracens, Pisalin kenopoifolia, and another species have orange fruits. I don't know that that species are edible. Um, Pelia, maybe you are. Are you there? Sorry, she wants to turn on her video or microphone and comment. Ah, uh, yeah. She said that, that two species are edible. Uh, Flavio, ¿tú sabes acerca de esas especies, cineracens, kenopoifolia? Mm -hmm. So, I, no, no tanto, no mucho. Verdad. Uh, okay, uh, I, I know that, I, I heard that the genus Yaltomata, there's another genus that is quite, I know that, 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 that some species are edible. In, in Peru, some people eat that species, but I know that in Mexico, uh, ustedes tienen jaltomatas eh, comestibles en México? No son comer, comercializadas. Son, son tomatillos grandes, ¿no? O son los mismos, ¿no? Eh, al tomata, que es otro género de solanas, eh, que mm. también produce unos frutos comestibles. No. Pero el no, cáliz no, no, no. es abierto. El cáliz es como abierto, no, no lo envuelve a, a la valla. Entonces, pero creo que se, com, se, com, se comen, digamos, más tradicionalmente en Perú. No, no, me parece que no están tan comercializados en México, pero quizás Ofelia puede decirnos si eh, ella debe saber si caltomata eh, se comercializa o se, es comestible en México. Solo me con esa pregunta, con esa duda. <risa> sea, so, solo ah. para como algo muy local, me imagino que uno va caminando y ve algún fruto maduro y y se lo come pero no como para los mercados eh, okay uh, I think this was our question uh, thank you Joseph and Flavio for this nice talk uh, and next week we are gonna uh, we are gonna have to Gloria Barbosa and Carolina Carrizo Garcia from University of Córdoba 
in Argentina, in Argentina, uh, uh, will, will speak uh, to us about the the journey uh, through the world of the capsicum from the chili pepper from the uh, he, uh, uh, and she's gonna and they are gonna tell us about the taxonomy, about the conservation and phylogeny of capsicum. And that is all for today. And um, thank you so much to everyone and have a happy weekend and see you next week. Thank you. Bye.